Good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for your patience. Um, today is the last of our public sessions that have been scheduled uh, for Democracy Now and Next. Uh, today we're talking about how democracy interacts with trade and development, options and challenges. So we'll be going through a series of sometimes options, sometimes challenges, and sometimes they're both. Um, I want to again thank our colleagues at Georgetown University, uh, and it's our pleasure, in fact, to have Mike Green with us, who is two-hatted. Um, Mike is the Senior Vice President for Asia and Japan Chair at the Center for Strategic and International Studies, uh, where he was a colleague of mine at CSIS, and he's the Director of, the, of Asian Studies at the School of Foreign Service at Georgetown University. You should also know that he served on the staff of the National Security Council from 2001 to 2005, so thank you for your service. First as Director for Asian Affairs and then as Special Assistant to the President for National Security Affairs and Senior Director for Asia with responsibility for East Asia and South Asia. And when I say thank you for your service, there's nothing quite like four years, is that four years in the National Security Council, which is nonstop, uh, perhaps even more so than serving four years in a crisis bureau at USAID, so hats off. Uh, you should know, you CMU colleagues, that he is also a trained bagpiper and was the pipe major in the U.S. Nationals, Mike? Oh, of the, of the yeah, the U.S. champion uh, pipe band. Excellent. One of, one of my pipers now, I think, teaches at CMU. Excellent. <laughs> So we're going to begin with a brief set of remarks, Mike, on your own intellectual history, your own journey, as they say, on this topic of advancing democracy as a foreign policy or U.S. national security interest. And then I'll go into a series of questions. And I want to remind everyone that as you're listening, be thinking about questions that you would like to ask, shorter the better, uh, and we'll try and get to as many as possible. So Mike, what is this, how were you coming to this issue advancing democracy uh, in, your, in your past? So I've always had um, an interest in strategy, foreign policy strategy, um, um, national security, but a voice in my head constantly asking about the morality, the ethics of what we're doing. And it comes, I think in large part from my father who was both a Marine Corps tank officer and worked in the civil rights division of the Justice Department. Hmm. Um, and so during the Vietnam War, he um, came back from Vietnam after uh, going out for, um, for sort of court martials. He, he was a lawyer, so he went from tanks to the courtroom. <clears throat> and he, as a major, went to the Commandant of the Marine Corps and said, sir, the Marines don't know what the Geneva Convention is. So he became very interested in and professionally very involved in what's called the law of war, so the Geneva Convention. So how can you have a war and yet have these questions of ethics and morality and proper use and bellow conduct. So I was, I actually did my honors thesis at Kenyon College on that topic and was fascinated. And then I got off into Asia, lived in Japan, studied Japanese martial arts and stuff. And um, when I went to graduate school, it was the late 1980s, mid to late 1980s, I went to SAIS and the realist school of international relations was very strong there. And I was taught that democracy values are not strategy. That's, you know, we need to be like the Europeans, like Metternich and Clausewitz and Thucydides and, and expunge this idealism from our foreign policy. And as an Asian studies student, I was taught in the 80s that, um, you know, Asians are different. They like authoritarian, centralized, you know, systems of government. We can't impose our Jeffersonian democracy. So I got, you know, I was on my way to being a strategist and an Asia expert. And then um, democracy hit. Reality in, interview. In reality hit in, in the Philippines, in Korea, in Taiwan, in the mid to late 80s, then with the end of the Cold War across the world. So I completely re, it rocked my world. And uh, President Bush, I know, was controversial with some people because of Iraq, but on democracy, he actually considered it a core part of foreign policy. So intellectuals were interested in that. And um, in my work since, I've been sort of trying to build a bridge between the national security community, the trade and economic policy making community and the democracy community, because I think they should not actually be um, uh, at odds or in tension. Uh, they actually serve each other well, uh, which is part of what we tried to do in this task force. I assume you've told people about. Absolutely. Uh, so in some ways I would say you're 
an intellectually kindred spirit. I was at Columbia uh, University at the same time, hearing the same kinds of things. And then, of course, the Soviet Union collapses, and I'm in Russia watching uh, lots of people very interested in democracy and, and human rights. So let's start with, I think, what's an option, but maybe also a challenge. What does it mean concretely to harness US economic power to support democracy and counter authoritarianism? And here I want to zero in on some of the re recommendations and reflections that you and your colleagues are making in your section of the task force on the need to reduce inequities, get our own house in order and advance sustainable growth. And in other words, how the power of our example matters for good or for bad, depending on what's going on in our house? Well, um, the first thing I'd say is that um, the US um, has um, you know, an interest in harnessing our economic statecraft, our, our trade negotiations, development policy to support anti-authoritarianism, counter-corruption and democracy because our businesses and our farmers and our workers have an interest in harnessing anti-corruption and democracy in the name of American economic interests. In other words, um, we want open, fair markets. We want sustainable growth in countries. Um, th the two should not be in contradiction. And I think increasingly the business community and labor are not as far apart as they used to be on this basic issue um, because we have obviously the gravitational pull of China's economy and some nefarious Chinese efforts to increase corruption and um, authoritarianism, although sometimes that aspect is overstated. But even if China doesn't have, intend to expand authoritarianism, it's making it easier for corruption and authoritarianism to exist and, and expand. So that's in our business interests, it's in our economic interests. Um, um, now, in terms of reducing inequities uh, at home, the challenges we have for democracy and Freedom House has found a decline in democracy over the last decade plus. Um, I, I hope we come back to that because I actually think there's some good news uh, mm. to counter that. But there is a, you know, look at my region, Asia, you've got coups in Thailand. Now you have this uh, violent coup in Myanmar. You have Duterte using extrajudicial uh, killing. There are a lot of reasons why we have this democratic backsliding, um, including in the US in some ways. But one of the reasons, not the main reason necessarily, we can debate that, but one of the reasons is um, economic inequity. Mm -hmm. A sense that democracy is not delivering uh, sustainable and inclusive economic growth. And I think there's a recognition of that even in the business community now. The business roundtable last year, which is a group of sort of the richest CEOs led by um, Josh Bolton, who I worked with in the White House, put out a statement saying that business in America has, has, a, has not only a responsibility to the shareholders, but to society. And, and to creating uh, reducing inequality. So there's a broad agreement now that reducing inequality is an important goal for uh, sustainable economics. It's not just about democracy, it's about capitalism. If we wanna continue support for free markets, and if you're a business leader, you have to think of how you reduce inequity. Where the, where the consensus break down, breaks down is who does that? Is it the responsibility of business, the private sector? Do you use market incentives? Um, to some extent, regulations perhaps, trade agreements, to incentivize uh, reductions in, in inequality, or does the government come in and uh, mandate uh, uh, increases in the minimum wage, um, you know, labor rights and things? And there, the consensus breaks down, and you can see it, frankly, in the current stimulus bill, where not a single Republican supported the bill because they are suspicious of the big hand of government. Um, so the how you do it part, I think, still we we have not reached a consensus, but the but the the principle, I think there's more consensus than there has been in a long time because of our democracy interests and because of our interest in maintaining a free market. You got It's got to deliver. It's interesting um, because of, in your section, the focus on sustainable economic growth, I've put on my sustainable development goals pin today, um, which we generally think of as nonpartisan, right? All countries supported this framework of the SDGs. But you're right, it's really in the mix of who's doing what uh, and how, where the consensus breaks down. And it was very stark over the weekend. Um, so, you know, to the extent that we can think about strategies for how to overcome that, I, I, which I don't know that we have answers to yet, um, but I think that that's going to be 
a really important piece of it. It is interesting that the private sector has been extremely supportive in general of the SDGs. They've actually been ahead of a lot of the NGO community. They're sort of in the same basket as mayors, uh, at least in this country and certainly in Pittsburgh, uh, that see this framework as extremely important for addressing issues uh, in their cities. And we think that that's, that's particularly interesting. Um, I wanna go for a second to this Freedom House point that you made. So what are you saying exactly, that it's not quite as negative as Freedom House is saying, that there are some gains? Well, Freedom House has noted a decline in, in democratic governance around the world. And if I remember correctly, the number is now only 48% of countries are whole or substantially free. Um, but the decline is in a lot of places, including the US right. or India, which is basically a democracy, but now is struggling with a variety of, um, you know, if you're following the farmers protests or right. um, Hindu nationalism, uh, or Korea, which is a remarkable story of democratization in the 80s, but now has, um, many people would argue, the most authoritarian leader it's had since democratization, ironically on the left, using mm -hmm. taxes and investigations to um, to hobble uh, their, their opponents on the right. So it's not, it's left-wing governments, it's right-wing governments, um, and that's a bad trend, it's a problem. And, and, and part of it is because we have been um, absent in, on these issues, partly. Um, but on the positive side of the ledger, we, for example, at CSIS do surveys every few years about regional order in Asia. You know, when we ask thought leaders across the region questions about rules and norms and, and security issues and trade. And um, when we ask thought leaders in Asia, what's, what's the most important principle for guiding the creator, creation of an East Asian community of a, of, a, of, a, of a community of nations in Asia, you know, in the top six, always, always are women's empowerment, free and fair elections, good governance. Um, so, except for China and sometimes Singapore. So, mm -hmm. so you think about Asia as one of the most dynamic, fastest growing regions in the world. You think of China as one of our biggest challenges. China is surrounded by countries like India and Korea and Japan and Australia and Indonesia where there's a very strong consensus, democracy, despite its flaws, is by far the best form of government. And that shows up in public opinion polls. So, gonna, so, so there, you know, it's not all bad news. Right. Uh, we have, we have uh, opportunities too, I think. Uh, very important. We're gonna go back to the surveys in a, in a few minutes. This is a rather long question, but an important question. And I think really gets to the central part of the theory of change that you're arguing for. Um, it's something of a conventional wisdom that the efforts to integrate China into the World Trade Organization had in the end a greater impact on the, the global economy than on how China does business. And by the way, you see the same dynamic of Russia in a number of international organizations in, in Europe. Um, why and how did that happen? Um, is it the case, would you argue, that the global economy had the unintended consequence of hurting American workers, that is globalization hurt. And how do we reconcile uh, that with trade policies that can actually advance good governance, uh, which I think is core to your, your argument. And I wanna note in a very kind of Washington way, <laughs> there was an op-ed today in the Washington Post by Dan Dresner, who is grading the interim national security strategy which came out last Wednesday and I shared with my students. And it's it's not that long, it's interesting reading. It came out incredibly quickly. It's pretty much unheard of that a document like this would come out inside of, I don't know, six months, let alone about six weeks. Um, but what Dan Dresner, who's at the Fletcher School, uh, what he criticizes is the administration for taking a mercantilist, that is trade generates wealth position. Uh, and it's very clear that the Biden administration from the president to the national security advisor to the secretary of state to others are arguing that everything they do in terms of foreign policy is linked to domestic policy. And they very much want to focus on working families, the middle class. You know, this is the spirit with which they come to the, the, the table. Um, and, and yet Dan is saying he doesn't believe that ultimately they are still pro-trade and that he doesn't see this as actually generating the kind of wealth that working families are gonna need. So that's a, a big bundle of questions. 
Um, but have at it. Well, um, the Trump administration uh, has, well, members of the former Trump administration, Secretary of State Pompeo and others, have been going out, giving speeches, saying that uh, they were awesome and everybody before them was not. <laughs> Basically, that um, the every you know Republican and Democratic administration, Obama, Bush, Clinton, was naive about China, and the Trump administration was the first to say China is not our friend. And in fact, Tony Blinken, the Secretary of State, in his testimony. Uh, one of the first things he said was the Trump administration got China right in the sense that it's not a strategic partner, it's a, it's a competitor. Um, but, but he disagreed with the approach, which was very unilateral, didn't maintain our advantages with allies and multilateral agreements. Um, so did the U.S. make a, a really bad choice, um, especially when the Clinton administration finalized China's entry into the World Trade Organization? Uh, giving it, you know, permanent normal trade relations and all the benefits of WTO and the obligations. Um, I still think the jury is out. In fact, I think probably innocent until proven guilty on that. Because the plan, the plan, which was, despite a lot of partisan debate, essentially shared from Clinton to Bush to Obama, was that um, China would come into the WTO and then we would hold China's feet to the fire. Um, in the WTO, but also with other trade agreements. And um, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which was begun under Bush, completed under Obama, would have created a trade agreement with all the major economies, uh, essentially, in uh, the Pacific Rim, you know, Canada, Mexico, Japan. And that would have put huge pressure on China to play by the rules. And then the next step would have been a transatlantic partnership because Europeans could not ignore an Asian trade agreement. They'd want to get in on it. So then we'd have 70% of global economic power. Boom. And we'd be in a position to go to the Chinese and say, you have high tariffs against you. You want to get in our group? You have to you know, fix your labor practices, protect intellectual property rights, stop state-owned enterprise monopolies. That was the plan. Meanwhile, uh, Clinton, I worked in the Clinton Pentagon, uh, Bush and Obama built up our alliances with Japan, especially, but India as a new partner, Australia, uh, just in case. And so that was all, I still think, the right strategy. The problem was a couple things happened. One was the 2008 financial crisis. Mm -hmm. We got really hit by Hammered. Mm -hmm. Hammered, including our, our confidence and China's confidence in our strength. Then the pandemic. Mm -hmm. Uh, and January 6th, which further undermined our um, authority and confidence. Um, and then we got Xi Jinping as leader of China, which, you know, agency in social science, agency matters. He broke the previous Chinese practice started by Deng Xiaoping, uh, the famous hide and buy, lay low, bide your time, don't chance the world. And he challenged the world very aggressively. Um, and probably in some ways, worst of all, uh, we pulled out of the Trans-Pacific Partnership uh, the Trump administration ignored WTO. So I think the Biden administration has a chance to kind of bend back to that strategy. We've lost a lot of ground, but in the long run, I still think it's probably the right strategy. We're going to have to do more with allies and partners. And you'll see, you've seen the Biden administration's emphasizing the so-called quad, US, Japan, Australia, India cooperation, because that, that, frankly, it's about China um, uh, and other things. But Dan Dresner's article is exactly right. What they're not doing is anything on trade. And it is kind of mercantilist. I mean, there's a lot of Buy America provisions now. There's a lot of industrial policy in the Congress. It's bipartisan. Um, if we don't join these trade agreements, we will be left out. And the US will lose billions and billions of dollars in exports and opportunities, but also we won't be there to write the rules. And China's going to start writing the rules in ways that are not favorable for us in the fastest growing economic region of the world. So uh, that that criticism by Dan Rezner was spot on. And Biden's from Scranton, his national security advisor, Jake Sullivan's from Ohio. They're from parts of the country that have not benefited from globalization. So it's Minnesota. Sincere. Minnesota. Minnesota. I grew up in the swamp. I'm from D.C. You know, I'll always be fine, I guess, until the big one. And then D.C.'s target number one. But um uh, so it's sincere and it's about rebuilding the heartland of the middle class. But you're not going to do that without trade. You're not going to do that without engaging the global economy. That's the problem. 
But, but isn't your argument really resting on regulations that really the problem was China joins, but then the regulatory power is not as strong. And so the, the answer is more coalitions with more teeth. I mean, you're right, yeah. the 75, 70%. And that, you know, perhaps we have a little bit, I would argue, maybe downplayed this in the task force when we think about the Summit for Democracy and we think about the jointness that I think you and I are both arguing yeah. for in our response to countering authoritarianism. It is critical that we're joined up uh, and on a variety of issues, whether it's the internet, trade, response to uh, human rights abuse, et cetera. And I, I just wonder if we haven't built in enough of that. So the US, so behind me right here is a book I wrote with 700 page history, 100 page of footnotes on the history of US strategy in Asia, trade, human rights and democracy, alliances, World War II, Korean War and so forth. In, I don't think very many people appreciate this. They think we're kind of dumb and lucky. We just sort of inherited Asia and the world after World War II, how hard can that be? In 1950, the US had half, half of global economic power, half of global economic output, 1950. By 1970, it was 25%. In relative terms, it dropped in half. And hmm. yet, and yet, um, America maintained the most powerful position in the world. How did we do that? Partnerships, alliances, um, uh, including with China, by the way, you know, we, 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 the opening to China was not about democratizing China in the 70s. It was about maintaining countering the balance the of power Union. and countering the Soviets. And that, that's partly why we did it. That's largely why we did it. I interviewed Henry Kissinger and others involved in that. And they said all they thought about was stopping the Soviets. That was so. Um, so we're, we're, we do that. Um, we are not going to maintain an international system that that follows uh, and advances values we care about, protects our people against terrorism and corruption and cyber attacks. We're not going to be able to do that on our own. Um, we have even less than a quarter of global GDP now. We've got to have allies mm. and partners. The Trump administration worked pretty well with Japan and one or two other allies, Australia, but for the most part, it was very unilateral. And I the noticed. Biden administration, yeah, and the Biden administration is saying, none of that. We're going to be very multilateral. We're going to work with allies. We're going to go back into the UN, back into, you know, transatlantic diplomacy, back into Southeast Asian multilateralism. But on economics, they're almost as unilateral still right now as the Trump administration was. That was Dresner's criti criticism. You got half of it, mm. but we have to have partnerships. And on trade, now I understand it um, because of the pandemic and the economic crisis that resulted in the US. You know, Franklin Delano Roosevelt's first 100 days, the New Deal, he was incredibly protectionist. He gave speeches blasting the French, blasting the British. He totally play played that nationalist card because um, he had to build capital for the New Deal. And in some ways, I think Biden's doing that. He sounds kind of mercantilist to build capital. He knows but there's what also I'm saying, but. a fundamental issue of supply chains. If you're if you're relying on certain goods to come from China, but we're in this conflict, and you also are concerned about American jobs and prosperity at home, I mean, they're, they're going to have to thread the needle, right? Yeah. They're going to have to have some some aspects that are made in America coupled with some aspects that are very much joint and coalition based. China's growing out of the pandemic faster than we are. And despite the Trump administration and the Biden administration's tariffs, over half of trade with China is now hit with some kind of tariff, uh, uh, decoupling as it's called, um, putting limits on technology transfers to China, despite the fact that China's investment in the US dropped over 90% uh, a year ago. Despite all of that, US investment in China actually has gone up this year because <laughs> that's where the money is. Right. It's like Willie Loman said about why he robs banks. That's where the money is. You know, big Sequoia, uh, BlackRock, the big hedge funds, the big financial firms, they're going where the growth is, which is China. So it's pretty complicated. I think in our section of the report, we focused a lot on a digital trade agreement. Say and, more about that. Yeah. So, th so, the World Trade Organization, the WTO, says that when you do a trade agreement, it has to liberalize substantially all trade. So you can't just do one sector. You got to do agriculture. You got to do financial services, labor rights. It has to be comprehensive. Those are really hard to pass in Congress right now. <laughs> um, I, yeah. polls, polls show that a majority of Americans support 
trade. And a majority of Americans, when last asked two years ago, three years ago, supported the Trans-Pacific Partnership. But it used to be Republicans in Congress and Republicans out in the country supported trade. Now polls show Republicans in Congress support trade because they're backed by the Chambers of Commerce and farmers, but rank and file Republicans who are older um, are anti-trade, are more protectionist, whereas Democrats are the opposite. Now Democrats in you know Schumer, Pelosi, they're backed by trade unions. They got so they're much more skeptical of trade, but your average Democrat now is younger, more educated, more international, and they think trade is fine. They're not afraid of other countries. So you know, the heads and the bodies of the two parties, Republicans are going to switch places. So these big trade agreements are politically tougher, but a, a more narrow sectoral agreement around digital trade could be really smart. The, Trump actually got, not Trump, but his, Bob Lighthizer, his U.S. trade rep, got a new agreement through with Mexico and Canada, and then with Japan, that included digital trade. And the Japanese and the Australians and the Koreans are really keen to do digital trade. And that matters because um, under China's rules, the government can take all the data mm. and can force localization of data. So you have to do all your servers and data in China. So that's really bad for our competitiveness and our, and our, and our economy. It's also really bad for democracy. So if you have a digital trade agreement beginning in Asia, expanding in Europe, and you have 70% of the world economy saying the government cannot force you to do servers in your country. The government cannot demand that all data is given to them. It, it, you can see how it would help us in commercial terms, but also help counter authoritarianism and set rules. So digital trade is kind of, I think, where you're going to see uh, action. The Australians, the Japanese, think tankers are talking about it. The only people not talking about it are the Biden administration. <laughs> they're still getting their act together. You know, they're still, as Dresner pointed out, they still don't have a plan. Well, they came into multiple crises. So, I mean, I'm absolutely. To be fair, Right. Like I said, FDR, we think of as a great president. He was even more protectionist and mercantilist and frankly, nationalistic right. than Biden, but partly because he was building political capital at home. We're going to go back to negotiation in a, in a few minutes, but let's, let's stay with China uh, and particularly China's approach to development through the Belt and Road Initiative. Um, this, is, this is a major initiative. There's capital flowing all over the world. There's a challenge in terms of the BRI representing uh, a counter to US bilateral assistance and other um, multilateral development banks. How do you compete or what would your advice be to the Biden administration, uh, the nominee for USAID, Samantha Pratt? How do you compete with China's alleged, I would say alleged, values-free lending? Uh, and you know, to what extent do we have tools that would in some ways change China's behavior? And by behavior, I mean corruption in some of these localities. Um, over to you. Well, um, one thing you don't do on Belt and Road is you know, pressure other countries not to take China's lending because there's more demand for infrastructure financing than there is financing available. You could add China, the US, Japan, Europe. And you still wouldn't get it. The, the, the World Bank, the Asia Development Bank, you still wouldn't have enough to build all the roads and the pipelines and the airports um, that they need in um, not just Asia, but, but Africa's parts of Africa are growing quite quickly too. And there's huge demand. So you can't go in and say, don't work with the Chinese because eventually they're gonna get the money from somewhere. W what you can do, and the Trump administration started to do this and the Biden administration is going to continue it, is offer an alternative. Um, the Japanese in particular, um, around the same time as Belt and Road, um, uh, they debate who came up with this first, but they offer what they call the free and open Indo-Pacific based on quality infrastructure. So Japan, which has fantastic infrastructure and a lot of Mm -hmm. um, financing, um, has said to Asia in particular, but other parts of the world, um, we're going to, we're going to, we're going to offer you ways to build your ports and bridges, but we're going to be more transparent. We're going to be more sustainable. We're going to structure the debt so you don't end up defaulting as happens with um, BRI. Um, and we're going to um, work with the Americans, Australians, and others. Um, and um, 
that is actually pretty effective. Uh, and what's happening is now Malaysia, for example, and other countries going back to the Chinese and demanding a better deal. And so um, the, the other piece of it though is, um, here's where the democracy part comes in. Cause you can, you can offer quality infrastructure for Japan, but if the Chinese can still bribe the minister of commerce or if the Chinese can still come in and um, shut down village enterprises to make way for infrastructure, um, you know, what's the point? So you've got to complement or supplement that alternative offer with strengthening of civil society, free press, uh, accountability, um, women's empowerment is very important for this. Um, uh, civil society groups, you, you wanna shine a light or help countries shine a light to hold the Chinese more accountable. And I think, you know, the, the Chinese are gonna be owed a lot of debt. And I think eventually we could find that the Chinese want to cooperate with us. Not now, mm. right now it's a, it's a knife fight for competition in Asia, but five, 10 years down the road, I would not rule out the possibility that by empowering these developing countries, we put so much pressure on China and China starts having so much debt it has to recover that we might actually be able to cooperate with China and find that their infrastructure is beneficial. So you're saying we'd have more leverage at it's that about, point. It's, it's all about leverage. I can't guarantee it, but that's not a bad end state and I wouldn't rule it out. At a minimum, we need to put the pressure on China to um, perform better and help countries receive receiving aid, empower them, give them leverage vis-a-vis -vis China. Well, this perform better piece, I think is really fundamental. Having been on, I was telling you before, roads going from Nairobi to Mombasa or going north into the Rift Valley and the, the roads were built by the Chinese, but they're melting. Literally um, melting. They're li and bumpy oh. and not oh. particularly safe or I think it's even more pronounced in terms of the railroad that goes from Nairobi to Mombasa, which was built by the Chinese and is run by the Chinese with uh, a terrible deal for the Kenyans. And that yeah. ultimately at some point, um, people wake up and say, this is not, this is not a good deal that we're yep. getting. Yep. I think that's increasingly evident. Look, countries are gonna take this assistance and the smart, smarter governments like Malaysia or Thailand are gonna demand a better deal than the Kenyans, frankly, or the Laotians, where they just don't have the capacity, the internal system of checks and balances and, and technical expertise. But the, the, the narrative around the world is that the Chinese stuff is not that great. Um, and, and, is, and is built and maintained by Chinese. Myanmar right now has some major projects that are just sitting dormant because all the Chinese workers have gone home. There are almost no Burmese or Karen or you know, people in Myanmar working on these roads. So that, you know, this is not good for China's brand and um, we can impose a cost on them for that if we offer an alternative. So I wanna just go to a question in the chat that is really about um, public diplomacy. Uh, this is an interesting question that I don't know that we've really addressed. Essentially, how can the Biden administration and the Congress get the American people up to speed on the importance of bolstering trade and development on how American prosperity and financial security is tied to our trade relationships uh, and how increasingly inseparable domestic and international spheres are. Basically Putnam's two level game. Yeah. Well, polls show that Americans, or at least a narrow majority of Americans get it and know that there's a connection. And part of the problem is that those who worry about damage from trade agreements have much more at stake and are therefore much more active. Um, and I think we also, look, we live in a, if not a fact-free environment, uh, a culture war environment. So, you know, what, one answer, an easy answer 10 years ago would have been, we can show you the economic modeling that shows if we join these trade agreement, it will increase employment in the US. It will increase the quality of jobs. It will increase agriculture exports. But who listens to data anymore? you know, professors at Georgetown and Carnegie Mellon and hopefully our students. So that's part of the problem. You can't make the case for trade based on data alone. The other problem is the business community is, um, is, is divided and um, not as unified as it was. Um, I think ultimately the case is gonna be made and actually a lot of people in the US Chamber of Commerce are starting to think this too. The case is gonna be made for international trade and, and, and development 
um, and international economic statecraft around a new uh, reconceptualization of why we do it. Um, hmm. So it used to be, as one friend of mine in the Chamber of Commerce put it, we, we'd pass trade agreements with very cynical rent seeking. And I've worked on these in the White House. You get agriculture is always on your side. The ranchers, the Cattlemen's Association, they're always on your side. They're the foot soldiers in the Congress. And then you get financial services, energy, um, and then a couple metal vendors like Boeing. And you get a couple of their issues in the trade agreement. And then you pay off the labor unions with trade adjustment assistance at the last minute to get enough Democrats. And that's just basically a cash, tra cash transfer to the unions. That's a very cynical rent seeking approach. That's not going to work anymore. Um, uh, uh, American politics is too fluid, complicated, mm -hmm. coalitions are shifting. And so interestingly, it's the Chamber of Commerce where people are starting to say, we need to reconceptualize this around values and labor about sustainable development, about countering authoritarianism. That's why a digital trade agreement makes sense. Um, we need to make this about more than just gains for certain parts of the US economy. That's not enough anymore. Um, so, I mean, so, you're basically making an argument that the future of work has to be conceived of differently and that the sustainability piece needs to be a part of it. There has to be a case that these trade agreements will, you need more, you need more to the coalition. You need people who care about democracy. You need people who care about, um, you know, about security, national security. Um, you need people who care about um, labor rights. You need them in from the beginning. What we do now usually is you bribe them at the end right. to get a couple of Democratic voters with the Republicans. That's not enough anymore. Um, and polls do show that that those those ideas have support out there. And and that who who's going to have to do that? President Biden. And and of course he can't do that right now. He's trying to get the stimulus package through. He's where he's done that. He's, so it's not. It takes the bully pulpit, and uh, Biden doesn't have the bandwidth right now. Well, one of the arguments that we have in the task force uh, draft, I don't know if it'll survive, um, and the final will be coming out April 14th, but, th and there was a piece of legislation on this, that there'd be a sub-national office in the State Department that has a sort of domestic-facing argument or domestic-facing office that explains to the American public everything that we've been talking about, the importance of supporting democracy, the importance of countering authoritarianism, the importance of trade agreements, uh, the importance of this in the 21st century, uh, and oh, by the way, lifting up things like private sector, chamber of commerce, mayors, uh, universities, and, and having them be understood as part of US global leadership. I'm, I'm a little skeptical about that proposal. Um, <laughs> Uh, or yes. it, I don't think that's the right solution. You know, when George Schultz was Secretary of State, every time there was a new ambassador who'd go in to see the Secretary for his brief interview before going to post, you've probably heard the story, Schultz would, would go over to a globe in his office and he'd yes. say, show me your country, and they'd spin the globe and show Norway or right. Thailand, and he'd go, that's not your country, and he'd point to the US and say, this is your country. And it's a great story. It makes you wonder why the ambassadors didn't tell the next guy, like why every <laughs> single person fell for it. But um, I, I, I think that it, this, this inward facing role is important. It's interesting, the Japanese foreign ministry, the Australian foreign ministry, DFAT, they do, they have ambassadors to prefectures. Yes. They do this. The Australians, when they produce a national security strategy or a, or a, or a diplomatic strategy, they have hearings around the country. Anybody can go. Yeah. And uh, so, yeah, I think in that sense, there's a logic to it. But I think actually the foreign service education system needs to change. Why um, isn't it an and also? Yeah, okay, and also. Um, uh, no, I think that um, I, one reason I'm skeptical is one problem the Biden administration is having is it's appointing too many senior coordinators, too yeah. many special envoys, too many summits. You start to lose the prioritization. But, but I, the basic principle, yes, I agree. Um, but I would start with the Foreign Service Institute and mid-career training for Foreign Service officers. You know, Foreign Service officers should spend a six-month or year tour in a state government or local government. Mm, that's a, uh, or working for an NGO in Chicago, downtown Chicago. I mean, that, 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 uh, I try to get, yeah, that's what you, uh, you don't want. They also need some training on public interest technology, right? I mean, they need to yeah. be brought, I mean, there are lots of different things. If you were yeah. going to design the Foreign Service of the United States for the 21st century, it would look and feel very different than what it does. 
Yeah, it's um, it's a you know look Georgetown where I teach still has more people going to the Foreign Service than any other school. It's a big part of why the School of Foreign Service was created in 1919. Mm -hmm. um, I try to tell my students um, when we do uh, class exercises. There's your bagpipe. Um, yeah, I, it's my ringtone. I don't let them be the State Department. Some I usually I often will ask make them be a labor union or an NGO or a company because um, in our democratic system of government that's how foreign policy is made. Well, it's also who you're meeting outside. I mean, yeah. so much of what you're doing is, is engaging. Let's talk a little bit more about the survey work that you've done at, at CSIS and specifically um, the views of democracy and human rights abuses in, in China. Um, I just saw a tweet from our colleague, Mike Abramowitz, um, suggesting that in fact, the Chinese were engaged in, in genocide or repeating yeah. Uh, that, that this was the case. Um, I mean, you're seeing no real big difference between the business community and their concern on democracy and human rights and, you know, the usual suspects who would be concerned about the, the democracy and human rights piece. Is that true? And why do you think that is the case? Well, the, our survey, which we did last uh, August, September of about 500 thought leaders, we worked with the Chamber of Commerce, AFL-CIO, other groups to to survey thought leaders, religious uh, groups, um, the national security experts, to map out where American opinions were on China, including human rights and democracy. And we were a little bit surprised how much convergence there is on the importance of democracy. We ask in the survey, which you can find on the CSIS website, how much risk should the US take to advance democracy and human rights? And we asked about Xinjiang, Hong Kong, Tibet, and inside China dissidents and so forth. And uh, the risk tolerance is pretty high. I forget what do you the exact think they numbers. think you mean by risk? Well, so I'd say that for civil society groups, for members of Congress we surveyed, they're willing to put a lot of pressure on China and put at risk trade relations, cooperation mm -hmm. on climate change and things. I think for the business community, there's a growing recognition that they need to, um, they need to, uh, have targeted pressure on China now rather than face something much worse later. So that's why you see more and more businesses trying to police their supply chains. Mm -hmm. um, the Chamber of Commerce being at least tacitly supportive of targeted sanctions on Hong Kong. Um, it's, it's a combination of things. Part of it is, you know, business. They don't want bigger sanctions later. They've come to the conclusion that a little bit of pressure now averts bigger pressure later. But part of it is um, that a lot of these businesses are seeing Chinese intellectual property rights theft. Um, they're seeing these authoritarian, look, in, in American companies in China, um, the Chinese are being forced to organize um, United Front cells for the Communist Party. Yeah. In, when American universities open campuses in China, they're being told you have to have Xi Jinping thought classes. They can, you know, American companies, universities operating in China can clearly see within their own the organizations, trend the tread line. So I think that's right. part of it. Um, the other piece, and this probably explains why in Japan and Korea, uh, there's more and more support for pressing China than there used to be. The other piece is Hong Kong. Yes. Because um, when people in Japan and Korea look at Hong Kong, they see themselves. Yeah. Xinjiang is a little more distant. Um, one of the most frustrating things in all this is that the org Organization of Islamic Conferences, the Muslim world, is mm -hmm. just not focused to take on the Chinese on Xinjiang. Yeah. It's, it's pretty pretty dis distressing. I, I could imagine that changing. I mean, when I was at USAID, we actually did a lot of work with them and with the, you know, it, with the Islamic. Oh, with OIC? Uh-huh. Yes. And I, and particularly in humanitarian assistance. Yeah. Um, I can, you know, U.S. global leadership was absent. Uh, if um, USAID, for example, engaged IOC on these issues, you know, I, I could imagine there might be a different outcome. Yeah. But I also see consumer demand playing potentially a much bigger role. I mean, this supply chain issue is really critical. And again, it's one of the reasons why we think um, business cares about the sustainable development goals because young people are gonna wanna have slave-free goods, right? Yeah. They, they wanna know where their cotton is, is coming from. And you know, so we see an, an, a, a number of, of companies increasingly focused on this. I, I'm conscious that we have 12 minutes left and I wanna to get to two important issues that I think are gonna be particularly interesting to students. One is on the role of negotiation. Uh, we don't necessarily think about negotiation 
advancing democracy. But you have some direct experience in this. Uh, and obviously, it, it, it certainly comes through on how you negotiate trade agreements. But w w what is the role, you know, and what is your advice, particularly for young people uh, who are interested in this aspect of negotiation? How do you marry the two? Well, our negotiation with China on human rights is at a dead end for now. Um, I, I may have been, in fact, I'm pretty sure I was the last senior director for Asia in the NSC who was able to, um, to get dissidents out of China. So President Bush would meet with Hu Jintao. He would, you know, hour long meeting with consecutive translation. So it's actually a pretty short meeting. And he would say I, something like, I'm very concerned about Tibet or I'm very concerned about what I'm hearing about the Uyghurs in China. And then he would say, because, um, because Hu Jintao would not be able to answer him on the spot. He would say, you know, my guy here is gonna give you a list, list. of names. Right. And, um, and they would pick a couple of it out. It was very cynical, but we'd get a couple out each time. Mm -hmm. Last time that happened was 2005. I don't think it's happened since. Well, I know the, and, the uh, designate, I may be wrong, but yeah. Well, the undersecretary designee for um, the J Bureau, uh, Civilian Security, Human Rights and Democracy, mm -hmm. Ezra Zaya, as the acting S assistant secretary, she was the person negotiating with the Chinese on the, the human rights dialogue. So I don't know whether she was able yeah, to. Yeah, the Chinese... And there's going to be a lot. There's high profile because they've they've had yeah. a Canadian and is it an Australian? They have two Canadians and an Australian, and and there are American ethnic Chinese American students who are not being allowed to leave the country. There's there's quite a few people actually right. being held. Some in jail, some just under house arrest. Um, uh, none of us have gotten them out really. It's a it's a. Uh, there are a few exceptions to that, but um, but the 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 the, the Chinese. Um, I, I think that one one thing that, that stopped it was Rabia Kadir, the Uyghur leader, got out and became very prominent and very active. And so the next time the foreign ministry said, we have to let out a dissident, the they didn't security want to have services that said, no way, that's part of it. But a bigger sort of macro reason is the Chinese just decided they don't have Enough. to listen to us, right. especially after the financial crisis and now January 6th. Um, so it's going to be tough. Um, however, the opportunity lies in the growing, um, you know, disgust and alarm in Europe and Asia, among other democracies, like Japan and Korea and Western Europe over the Xinjiang situation, Tibet and Hong Kong. And so we have less direct leverage, but we have more opportunities to start building coalitions um, to gradually start putting pressure on, on China um, and showing support. But it's, it's gonna be tough. They're, the Chinese feel very confident right now about their ability to resist our pressure. But again, you know, on this issue of negotiation, uh, in part, does it depend on where it's coming from? I mean, if there is a coordinator from the National Security Council for Asia, and he may, and it happens to be a he, and he makes it a priority, that's, and maybe he's doing it together with colleagues from Japan, or, I mean, there are ways of doing this that perhaps could rather than having it the usual suspects is what I'm trying yeah, to yeah. argue. I think that's exactly right. It, it, it used to be that the regional offices in the NSC and state and the democracy and human rights offices who were always smaller and always, of course, much more um, intelligent and charming, <laughs> Sarah, but were always smaller and had less bureaucratic heft generally, yes, yes. that the regional and the functional didn't play well together. Yep. And, uh, uh, you know, if nothing else, one thing I feel like I did in my four and a half years on the NSC was, was work really well with the Religious Freedom Ambassador, mm -hmm. the Trapping in Persons, USAID, DRL, and our offices in the White House. And it was so much better. So for example, we had a geopolitical interest in 2005 in aligning with Vietnam to counter China's growing influence. And the Vietnamese wanted it too, but they were shutting down house churches and they were closing parochial schools and arresting priests. And the religious freedom ambassador uh, was under pressure from Congress to move them from watch list to actual sanctions. So how could you have the prime minister of Vietnam come to meet President Bush while they're being sanctioned? You can't. Right. So I was sent to your point, not the religious freedom ambassador who was really great about this said, I want you to go because you're not the religious freedom ambassador. So I was sent to Hanoi with a letter from President Bush that basically said, you know, we got to do this. You've got to fix this. And they did. 
they 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 opened the, the host churches, they opened the parochial schools. You know, two years later they closed half of them. And I went back to see President Bush and reported on it. And he said, So you're telling me that the Vietnamese are more afraid of China than they are of God. And um in, in which was not too far off. So we we need to use our national security interests uh, and uh, it's leverage sometimes because if we're going to align with the Vietnam, if we're going to align with India, for it to be sustainable in a democracy like ours, it, it has to be credible. Um, you also just made a big argument for students to pay attention to, which is sometimes you get something done, but you don't necessarily get credit for it. I mean, your colleague yeah. had the right size ego to be able to say, I'm more interested in this getting done yeah. than me doing it. Yeah, he wrote the script. I just smiled and, and invoked the president's name. But you're absolutely right. I mean, the, this is a really well, important Well, both part of you of, were willing to do it. Yeah, and I, uh, we got along well, and I, I, I cared about it. And I, I, was, I was brought up Unitarian, so having a bunch of Catholic church open just because I went to Hanoi was a surreal experience. But, um, but, the important, but your point is the key one. Um, the messengers for the U.S. on democratic values cannot just be the people in charge of that in USAID and state. It needs to be the Secretary of Defense. And I think Lloyd Austin actually is starting to do that as SecDef. It needs to be the ambassadors, of course. It needs to be the White House and National Security Council. And it needs to be consistent. It can't just be one off. Right. Um, uh, and, you know, I'd rather have the president and the vice president and secretary of defense quietly mentioning this in every meeting than have nothing happen and then sanction and have a huge fight yeah. with our allies. It's, yeah. it's, it's persistent. George Schultz, my favorite secretary of state, said it's like gardening. A little bit yes. at a time, a little bit at a time. And every day. Yeah. Um, so yesterday was uh, International Women's Day, although we think of every day uh, as, <laughs> as Women's Day. But um, let's talk a little bit about the role of policies that involve empowering women to advance good governance and inclusive sustainable, uh, sustainable growth. Because I think a lot of times, again, to your point, people see it as nice to have, but it's actually really fundamental. There's tons of evidence on this. It, it's really fundamental. And there is tons of evidence. And um, and yet. And yet. So um, uh, OECD studies, World Bank studies, you know, G Goldman Sachs studies show that if women participate in the economy at, at the OECD average, the countries like Japan and Korea, which have lower rates, could increase their productivity faster than any other tool available to them. So for economic sustainability, it's a no-brainer. And the Japanese actually, under Abe, did bring over 2 million women to the workforce and start to bend that. But then they didn't do the hard part, which is infrastructure, childcare. Um, hmm. a, a lot of studies show that when you have women involved in ceasefire agreements, sure. they stick. Right. They well, stick. this is the main issue with the Afghanistan they stick. treaty and that's, at the moment. That, and that is why I am very skeptical that will hold. And, mm -hmm. and then... Um, you know, with the work of microfinancing, you know, where did the microfinancing go? It went to women in South Asia, especially Bangladesh initially, because empowering them with wireless cell phone access to um, capital, um, they were just better at it. <laughs> um, so there's all kinds of ways where this matters. What, what's really fascinating to me is how much countries you wouldn't expect it from, like Japan, um, Australia, you might expect it, are, are, are internalizing this. The US and Australia and Japan are forming a very close security relationship because we have strong navies and interest in security in the South China Sea and the East China Sea. And a few years ago, years ago, I went to Australia for the Talisman Sabre, which was the big US-Australia, now US-Australia-Japan exercise. So Marines, Air Force, Navy. And I went and, and um, one of, you know, they practiced bombing things, they practiced, you know, rescuing Pulling people. things up. Mm -hmm. They had an exercise about gender. How do you incorporate women in peacekeeping, peace resolutions, protecting gender based, you know, against gender based violence in a hostile situation? And it was a really big deal. And all three militaries were thought it was not just publicity, they thought it was really important. And the Japanese, in particular, are interested because they don't have enough women in their military. If, if the Japanese have about 9% of the forces women, we're about, I think it's 18, 19%. So the Australians, the Japanese wanted to do it because they need more women to join the military because of their demographic decline. So in a lot of very practical ways, even in defense policy, um, but if, as we said, development, microfinance, um, uh, ceasefires, 
um, there's really strong statistics to show that when you include women in the solution, it's, it works better, it sticks. And um, there's, you know, there's a residual ethos in the US military. I, to be honest, I think even in USAID that this does not matter. That as, as one military guy said, it's a rock in our rucksack. It's just extra, it's not, it's nice to do, it's not must do, but I, I'm convinced as a matter of national security strategy, it's a must do. As somebody who served as a senior gender advisor at USAID, it, it's all about leadership. Uh, no. Don Steinberg was the deputy administrator. And every week I would join a group of, of other senior advisors and he would say, what have you done for me lately? You had to every week come in, it, it was the gardening thing. And yeah. if he was elevating it, um, then it was, it was happening. If you don't have leadership, it, cause it's not muscle memory yet. Right. It's, it's in, you know, there's lots of good rhetoric, but it isn't necessarily fundamental. Um, and I think, you know, there is the possibility of seeing uh, that become further institutionalized, I would say in, in this administration. Mike, we've come to one o'clock. Um, this is the part of the semester where students are also scrambling to yeah. finish papers and get ready for exams. Uh, I want to thank you so much for lending us your expertise, uh, your experience, your stories, um, and you know, sometime we'll have you come back and, and play the bagpipes. So thank you so much and thank everybody and Georgetown University and CMU colleagues for helping us get out the word. And, uh, Stay tuned. There may be more on democracy now and next in the in the coming weeks. So thank you so much. Be well. Thank, be safe. Thanks, Sarah. Thank you all. Bye. Bye.